Hello and welcome to part 11 of Sporanza Guesses the Methods Exam. Now I hope this is the last in the series. This is the one where I go back through the previous 10 and fix any mistakes that I made. Now I've been studying, this is an advanced technique for getting that knowledge into here. So I can get rid of this now and let's get started. Now probably the biggest mistake I made was in question 11b right here. Let's take a look. The question is asking us to determine derivatives and I went from A down to B and I very confidently just started using the chain rule and came to this horrible answer here. And I was called out in the comments because I should have seen this E and this LN and immediately spotted that, hey, E to the power of an LN, I'm going to be able to simplify that. So the question is asking us to derive Y equals E to the 4 LN 2X. Now before I start deriving it, I can take that 4 there and take it up here to a power. So I've got e to the ln 2x to the power of 4. And it's that 2x that's being raised to the power of 4. So that gives me y equals e to the ln. And we've got 2 to the power of 4, which is 2, 4, 8, 16. 16x to the 4. So that's getting real close here e to the ln 16x to the 4. And if you've got e to the ln, that simplifies to simply y equals 16x to the 4. Whatever you've got in that ln comes down and that e and that ln disappear. So I haven't even started deriving yet y equals 16x to the 4. So dy dx is equal to 4 times 16 which is 64x to the 3. Okay, so how big was my mistake? Well, you could argue that I am technically correct because it says determine the derivative, no simplification required. I have determined the derivative, but I, and I also haven't simplified it. So this is probably technically correct. Can I fix the mistake that I've made in this process? Yes, I can. So I can write 4 on x, and then I've got times e to the ln 2x to the 4. So 2x to the 4, that's what we did over here. So that's still e to the ln 16x to the 4. And then that e and that ln cancel each other out again. So then we've got 4 on x times just 16x to the 4. Okay, and you can see where this is going to lead us to. We've got 4 times 16, which is 64, and we've got x to the 4 divided by x, which is x to the 3. Okay, so I've redeemed myself here. This answer is the same as this answer. Do I think my answer is technically correct? I suppose, but it's also really dodgy. If you see e to the ln, your alarm bells should start going off straight away. And I know I've said that to my students before. Your alarm bells should start going off and you should be trying to cancel that e and that ln. Uh, okay, so that's the biggest, probably most egregious mistake I made. Everything else I show you is probably improvements on methods that have been suggested in comments. So the next little mistake I make here is in part C of, which question was this? Part C of question 13, tech free. Now I get the correct answer, but my working's a little bit sloppy here. Now the reason my working's sloppy here is because I haven't really defined very well what success and failure are here. And success and failure change over the course of the question. So in part A, We've defined the probability of success as being a tagged cow. So I'm just going to write that there. Tagged cow. Okay, and so the probability of being a tagged cow is 1 in 3. And so here, calculate the probability that the number of tagged cows selected on a given day is 0. Probability that x equals 0. Done. Okay. And we continue on with that, right? But here... 16 over 85, what does this P represent here? Okay, that P represents success being no tags, no cows tagged, or no tagged cows on a day. That's what this wants, right? And I've said 
It's, the question is, determine the probability that no tagged cows are selected on each of six days. And then I've written the probability that x equals zero. It's not the probability that x equals zero, it's the probability that x equals six. I want six successes where successes are no tagged cows on a day. Um, why was I being sloppy here? I guess I understand how this equation works and I don't get super excited about notation, but that's that's pretty dodgy work. So whenever you create a variable, like for instance, I've written p equals 16 over 8, 81, it's a good idea to define what your variable is. In this case, probability of success is no tagged cows on a day. There is an alternative way to do this where you define p as at least one cow tagged on a day, and then you approach it from that standpoint. So in that case, writing x equals zero would be correct. So define things. Don't be lazy like I was here. Okay, we now move on to part four. So it's question three, tech active, multiple choice. Um, this question here, it's an interesting kind of one because I've gotten to the right answer, but I've moved really slowly to get there. You can go back, watch this video and see what my method was. But basically I found that intersection point then I found the area of A, negative 5.33, uh, and then I solved for 5.33 between the intersection, which was 2, and that value of A, and found that value of A, which was 2 root 3. So, of course, in the comments, we have a way faster way of solving this. And the way of seeing it is that if these areas are going to be equal, the area of the region marked A is the same as the area of the region B, right? This area here will spit out a positive value if you integrate that. This area here will spit out a negative value if you integrate that. But if you integrate between 0 and a from here to here of the function, it is equal to 0 because these are cancelling each other out. So if you solve f of x between 0 and a, and f of x in this ca case is x squared minus 4, you should be able to come to that a value. Now you need to be a little bit uh, circumspect here because if you just try to solve that using n solve on a ti, it's just going to give you an answer of a equals 0. And the reason it gives you an answer of a is 0 is because that's correct. If you've got terminals of 0 and 0 here and you make it equal to 0, it would be correct to say that if you integrate under an infinitely small curve between 0 and 0, you will get an answer of 0. But there's also another answer here. So uh, I'm not going to jump through it here, but I wanted to show you that there's this trick, I suppose, that if you have equal areas below and above the curve, the total area is going to be equal to 0, or the total integral is going to be equal to 0. It was also in this same video where I was trying to determine the length of the longest side in this triangle below. And what I did when I attempted to do that, and I got the correct answer, but what I did was uh, determine this angle theta using a sine rule. And it was an ambiguous case, so I had two solutions and I determined which solution I wanted. And then I did it a second time to determine this unknown length, this A value here. But uh, again, very clever commenter in the, um, in the comments section said, no, you should just use the cosine rule straight away here. So the cosine rule that they used here um, looked like, looked like this right here. So look at what this looks like, because it'll be a little bit non-standard. We've got 12 equals, 27 squared plus the unknown length a squared minus 2 times 27 times a and then cosine 26 and that 26 is the angle opposite this 12 squared here. I say this is a little bit non-standard because back in my day at school you would never attempt something like this because solving this gets really really ugly on a scientific calculator. Of course We've got graphics calculators now, 
And so making this play is not terrible. Now, this will spit out two solutions um, if you end solve it on a Casio. If you end solve it on a TI Inspire, it's going to spit out one solution. So if you want this to spit out two solutions, you're going to have to graph y equals 12 squared. You're going to have to graph y equals all of that nonsense. I'll just write right-hand side here and find where they intersect. And they should intersect at two places. So here in GeoGebra, I've graphed my two graphs. You can see um, I've graphed the right-hand side, I've graphed the left-hand side. I've got two intersection points, 26.24 and 22.29. Uh, those answers, one of those answers corresponds to the answer I found, 26.24. The other answer corresponds to the angle that I rejected in my first step. So do I think this is a better method yeah, yeah, I think it's a better method. Um, I'm just a dinosaur, I guess. Um, that's why I, that's why I went with, with my method here. So this question, it was question 15, Tech Free. This is in part five. Uh, this was a proof by recog... Uh, not a proof, integration by recognition, right? Um, and it was part B that someone was a little confused about. So I haven't made an error here, but I want to clear it up. Now, the thing that someone was asking me about was in between this line here and this line here, right? So on this left-hand side, I've got x ln x plus c equals, and then on the uh, right-hand side, I've got the integral of 1 plus ln x. And I see that integral into the integral of 1 with respect to x and the integral of ln x with respect to x, and then I integrate 1 to x. And this is the bit that um, the commenter said, wait, when you integrate this, shouldn't we also have, shouldn't it be x plus c here? And um, the commenter's right. When you integrate something, you do get a plus c. But if we game this out a little bit, we get x ln x plus c equals x plus c integral ln x with respect to x. Now, are these c's the same number? No, they're an arbitrary constant. They're any and all numbers. So we've got this weird um, situation now where it feels like we can cancel them out. We cannot do that because they're any and all numbers, right? So um, if you want to go down this path when you're, when you're integrating on both sides of an equation, specialist students will have seen this sort of thing before, um, you can do it by writing like, this is C1 and this is C2. And then when you bring them to one side, like I am bringing them to one side here, arbitrary constant 1 minus arbitrary constant 2 will be equal to arbitrary constant 3. Um, I hope that clears that up. If my working is fine here because it kind of just roll, but by not putting in the second arbitrary constant, it just gets assumed that the second arbitrary constant is there. So the working that I had was fine, but I think it confused a few people. How am I integrating without a plus C appearing? Um, so there you go. Okay, jumping forward here, and this is the last one I'm going to do in this video. Um, the big mistake I've made here is not in my solution. It's in writing the question itself. So this thing here is just garbage, right? It's a probability density function. So it's just better to say that the probability density function is just f of x. So this is a probability density function. f of x equals blah, 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 blah. Okay? And then it becomes... We can use notation that looks a little bit like this, but still not that, but a little bit like this. So, for instance, if we wanted to find some probability, say the probability that the watermelons were between 7 and 10 kilograms, we would say that the probability that the watermelons are between 7 and 10 kilograms is equal to the integral between 7 and 10 of the function with respect to x. The reason I said not that is because that equal sign there is reserved for things that uh, have discrete values. And a probability density function, this is a continuous normal, a continuous random variable. So we're going to have less than, oh, nearly made another mistake here. 
Seven less than X less than ten. We're going to have less thans. We're going to have bounds that we need to be working within. So, don't know what I was thinking there, but it was on holidays. So, if we finish up with a bit of an overview of my mistakes, I think we get the following. Um, question 11 on tech free was my most egregious mistake. Uh, if you have something, E to the LN something, alarm bells. You've got to see the E to the LN something. I think the reason I made this mistake is because I was talking endlessly about product rules and chain rules and quotient rules. Do I think that question 11 on the tech free is going to look remarkably similar to this? Yes, I do. I think that they're going to... This seems to be the, the pattern in exams. But if you do see something like that, alarm bells. So I think that's the roughest one. The other ones were really more about was I using the most efficient path to the answer? And the answer there is no. Uh, there was many times where people in the comments were coming up with more efficient ways to get to the answer than I did. Uh, so good job to those who saw that. Don't be scared in an exam situation, though, to plough forward on a path that may not be the most efficient way. Because you can see, I got to the right answers, I just got there probably slower than was possible. But if I'd spent two more minutes trying to figure out a more efficient method, then I may never have gotten there, or it would have taken the same amount of time because I had to do that extra thinking time. So don't be scared to plough forward with a, a plan something. Uh, and then finally, I just, just didn't write a question good. So I think it was a pretty good shot. Uh, it was the September holidays, cut me some slack, uh, but I hope that clears up some of the confusion. Now I've been sort of holding off on making this video because I've been waiting for those comments to appear, uh, for people to pick up my mistakes, for people to show me more solutions. Uh, you'll see that most of these seem to be from the first four or five videos. And they're the videos that have the most views. So I'm sure that as soon as I release this video, someone will be in my comments in the next 24 hours to show me a mistake that I made in video 7 or something. Uh, so feel free. I'll make another one, I guess. Uh, but keep studying. Good luck.